what's the value of your source code? Like seriously, take a moment to think about this for your current project. If you had to put a dollar value on your code, what would that be? In this video, I want to argue that even for bigger projects, this value is probably much closer to zero than you might think. I also want to give you a new perspective on programming as a whole, inspired by Turing Award winner Peter Nauer. I was confronted with this question a few years ago when I was working at a smaller company doing indoor navigation software. So basically Google Maps in big buildings like malls, airports, and factories. There was also an augmented reality mode so we could display arrows on the floor that show your destination or additional information like virtual signs or real-time info about machines in factories. It was a pretty cool project and the tech stack was super interesting. There was a low-level computer vision component written in C++ for cross-platform support, a native layer for iOS and Android, cross-platform rendering in WebGL, and a pretty complex admin interface for the web. And you know, this project started in the early 2010s, so there was no AR kit or AR core that made it easy to include some AR, like today. We actually had to write that all ourselves with some computer vision libraries, and we even worked together with a research institute to get this to work. So basically, this wasn't just something anyone could easily recreate. On the team, we just implicitly assumed that our code was really valuable and one of our major assets. Then at some point, a new manager joined the company and he had mostly worked in bigger companies before. And he was super concerned with security. So he argued that we shouldn't keep our source code in a cloud-hosted GitHub repo. He was worried that Microsoft, the owner of GitHub, might just be able to take our code and build a competing service. Now, that's ridiculous, of course. Microsoft would never do something like this. Like, they would never build an AI that just uses your private code as training data. Like, that would never happen, right? No. But seriously, back then, this got me thinking. Why did this feel ridiculous? Like, if we leave all ethical and legal concerns aside for a moment, why wouldn't Microsoft or any other big company just use our code if they wanted to build a competing service? And then, going even further, I thought, what would happen if we just open sourced everything? If we put it all in a public repo with an open license like MIT? Our investors would probably have thought that we've gone crazy, but other than that, what direct impact would that have had on our company? After thinking about this for a while, I think the answer back then would have been absolutely nothing would have changed. You know, we were still a young startup, so our code was changing pretty drastically every couple of weeks. Sometimes we change major parts of the architecture or rewrite components because the requirements change so quickly as we discovered new things about our customers. And as it often goes in such a situation, the code quality was pretty bad. Half the time the build system was broken, testing and documentation was basically non-existent, and it was unlikely that anyone from outside the team would even have gotten the thing up and running. Even if they did, it would be outdated a moment later. So of course Microsoft would never take our code. They'd be much faster just building it themselves from scratch than trying to understand the crummy code that we just hacked together. But okay, I hear you say, maybe your code was crummy. But my code is beautiful. All right, so let's take a step back and assume the opposite for a moment. Beautifully written, clean code with complete test coverage, one-click build process, well-written documentation of architecture and components. Would this actually have changed the situation? I really don't think so. You see, in 2017, there was an incident of a pretty high-profile source code theft. The name of the company was, appropriately, Panic. It's a company that makes high quality software for Mac and iOS. And they've also released some games like Untitled Goose Game and Firewatch. They had the full source code of most of their apps stolen by hackers. The attackers threatened that they'd release the source code and demanded a ransom. But Panic refused to pay. And in a blog post, they went through all the worst case scenarios of what the hackers could do with the code. They said that the worst thing that could happen would be people building cracked versions of their apps that are full of malware. But that was already happening anyways, even before the source code was stolen, just like with most software. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm sure this was a pretty bad blow for Panic, and I'm not arguing that stolen source code can't be damaging. But was Panic worried about competitors stealing their high quality code? In a blog post, they wrote that they weren't too concerned with that, mainly because it would quickly become outdated. That source is already missing a ton of fixes and improvements we committed over the last week alone, and six months from now, it will be missing major critical new features. In short, it's old and getting older. So this is really interesting, right? 
Here we have a multi-million dollar company basically saying that they don't worry about competitors using their code. So if the value is not in the code and documentation, where is it? And why is writing new code sometimes faster than understanding and modifying existing code? I couldn't wrap my head around these questions until I stumbled upon this article, Programming as Theory Building by Turing Award winner Peter Nauer. If you've ever taken a compiler course, you might've used his work already since he's the N in Bacchus Nauer form, a notation for specifying programming languages that is still in use today. In his article, Nauer gives his view on this surely very simple and easy to answer question. What is programming? He says that most people view programming as a production process and he calls this the production view of programming. He argues that some empirical observations in software projects can't be explained with this view, but they can with this alternative theory building view of programming. I'm gonna explain this with some real life examples from one of my previous projects. I was working at a factory where the workers were still using paper processes to document their work. We made a custom tablet app to digitize this process. Now in the production view of programming, we of course have programmers. They get input from external stakeholders and they observe a slice of the real world that's relevant to the problem. They then take this input and produce technical artifacts as output, so basically code and documentation. The problem with this view, according to Nawa, is that the technical artifacts are the final output, while the programmers are viewed as easily replaceable machines that just produce this output. In contrast, in his theory building view, the focus is on the programmer, who again observes the real world, and as they write the code in their head, they also build a mapping between the code and the real world. Each piece of the real world that's relevant to the problem needs to be mapped to some technical artifact. That could, for example, be a specific class, method, or data structure, an overall architectural decision, or maybe simply a line in the documentation. The main difference to the production view is that the code is just a side product. The real product, the real output of this process, is the theory, the mapping between the real world and the code. So basically, the arrows in this diagram are the real output. Everything else is just a side product. Now you might say, well, why don't we just take this theory and put it into written documentation as well? Then it would be really easy to onboard new developers to our code so they can be productive really fast. But Nawa argues that exactly this step isn't possible. He writes, the code and its documentation has proved insufficient as a carrier of some of the most important design ideas. A main claim of the theory building view of programming is that an essential part of any program, the theory of it, is something that could not be conceivably expressed, but is inextricably bound to human beings. Now that's a pretty strong claim, but I think that Nao has some really good arguments for it. He says that there are three different aspects of the theory that are just in the programmer's minds and go beyond what's visible in the source code or documentation. These three aspects are intangible, so they're difficult or even impossible to communicate indirectly via written documentation. For the first one of these aspects, Nauer says, the programmer must be able to explain for each part of the code and for each of its overall structural characteristics, what aspect or activity of the world is matched by it. So basically someone new to the project should be able to point at any piece of code and the original programmer can tell us how it's mapped to a specific object or situation in the real world. And the other way around, of course. This direction is even more difficult as now writes. By far, the largest part of the world will of course lie outside the scope of the code, being irrelevant in the context. However, the decision that a part of the world is relevant can only be made by someone who understands the whole world. So basically not everything in the real world has a direct mapping to source code. And of course, we as programmers have to know and decide which parts are actually relevant to the problem at hand. For bigger projects, I just don't see how documenting all this information would be practical. So for example, the factory app that I mentioned earlier was itself pretty simple, but the underlying business processes were super complex. There were different assembly lines and machines involved. Also, the environment was changing and evolving quite often. Workers changing their shifts around, the Wi-Fi in the factory would go down or be unavailable in some areas, machines would break down, stuff like that. And downtime in the factory was really expensive. So the app had to be prepared to handle all these situations. 
So even if we had had the time and budget to document all this, I really don't see how anyone would have benefited from that documentation. It would probably have been a couple hundred pages and it would have been really difficult finding the information that you're actually looking for. But difficult is not impossible, which is why I think this is actually the weakest argument Nawa makes for the theory building view. So let's take a look at the other two arguments. The second one is that for each mapping, we could have chosen an entirely different implementation in the code. So according to Nawa, the programmer having the theory of the program can explain why each part of the program is what it is. In other words, is able to support the actual code with a justification of some sort. So basically an explanation of why we made certain technical decisions. He goes on to explain that this justification can't just be pressed into a set of rules, but instead requires intuition and experience. In my opinion, programming is a lot about choosing the right trade-offs based on your experience and compressing all these technical decisions, which are often based on intuition into a written document seems really impractical to me. Like for major architectural decisions, it makes complete sense to document this, but imagine you had to justify in writing every single technical decision you make. I think this would drive me insane and I wonder how much value this would actually provide to a newcomer who's being onboarded to the project. Also for each problem, there's an infinite number of possible implementations that we could have chosen and new approaches or architectures are being proposed every day. So we wouldn't just have to document why we chose the current implementation, but also why we didn't choose any of the millions of other possible implementations. So I think here it's pretty clear that it's impossible to document this aspect of the theory exhaustively. But now let's get to Nawa's third and in my opinion strongest argument for the theory building view, which is that the real world is constantly changing. And with those changes come new requirements. We as programmers then have to decide how similar the new use case is to the features that are already built into the program. Like, can we implement this functionality with any of the existing code or do we need to build entirely new components or abstractions to cover this use case? Now I write, designing how a modification is best incorporated into an established program depends on the perception of the similarity of the new demand with the operational facilities already built into the program. I think here it's pretty clear that this is impossible to put into any kind of written documentation since it involves making decisions on how to deal with changes in the real world that we haven't anticipated yet. Otherwise, we could have just incorporated them into the design of the original program in the first place. Let me give you another real life example from the factory app. So after having the app in production for a while, we realized that the data entry was somehow inconsistent. It took us a while to investigate, but then we found out that this was because of some secret smoke breaks that the factory workers took and that management didn't know about. Once we figured this out, it was super easy for us in the core dev team to add a simple addition to the code to deal with this case. But I think if we had handed the code over to the client already, it could have been possible that they'd spend weeks to fix this since they didn't know where exactly to make changes to the code for this. Of course, it would have been impossible to write down any hints or guidance for dealing with this case in advance since we didn't anticipate this at all. In my experience, such things happen all the time in software. And only those that deeply understand the program can implement new use cases while keeping the original structure of the program intact. Nawa also brings up a few similar case studies where a different dev team that took over the original code was struggling to make changes. Instead, they made additions that destroyed its power and simplicity. They didn't make use of the existing abstractions built into the program, but instead came up with their own less elegant solutions, creating some kind of Frankenstein code monster. So I think that altogether, these three arguments make a good case for the fact that the theory can't be put into any written documentation. But does that mean we're just screwed? That we can't ever transfer the theory from one programmer to the other? Now it says it's still possible, but it requires personal interaction. What is required is that the new programmer has the opportunity to work in close contact with the programmers who already possess the theory so as to be able to become familiar with the place of the program in the wider context of the relevant real-world situations, and so as to acquire the knowledge of how the program works and how unusual program reactions and program modifications are handled within the program theory. He even compares these interactions to teaching a skill like writing or learning a musical instrument. 
A professional concert pianist also wouldn't be able to teach you how to play a certain piece just by writing down stuff or making recordings. You need personal interaction with them to properly learn from them. I think overall, the theory building view really helps answer our initial questions. Source code itself has little value since it's unable to communicate the full theory. And this is also why it's often faster to write a new program from scratch than trying to understand and modify one that already exists. Because then you'd have to rebuild the entire theory of the program in your head. And depending on your background, it's often easier to just build an entirely new theory that fits your experience and perception of the world. I think this is also why onboarding in software projects is often so slow. And it's just crazy to me that we're in an industry where turnover is so high that people change jobs every few years, even though so much value is tied up in an individual contributor. I think companies would be well advised to not treat developers as replaceable cogs in a machine, but instead realize that a lot of the domain knowledge they've built up over the years can't be easily replaced and has to be built up again from scratch. I also think that our tooling, so programming languages, IDEs, version control, could do a much better job at helping to transfer the theory from one programmer to the other. Imagine a world where you could just open up any big open source project on GitHub, immediately understand the code and make changes to it in a single day. Right now, if you'd want to make changes to a big project, like let's say the Linux kernel or a browser engine or something like that, it would probably be a mistake to go in by just reading the code. Instead, you'd probably want to read some kind of overview of the overall structure and modules, or even better, watch a video or do a live session with someone walking you through the code and explaining the parts that are relevant to what you're trying to accomplish. Isn't it a bit silly that the fastest way to understand code is not to just go and read it? It's crazy to me that most developers, myself included, actually don't read other people's source code on a regular basis. Imagine a writer who themselves doesn't read many other books or a musician who doesn't listen to a lot of music. That's just crazy. I think this is a failing of our current programming languages and tooling. I'd love to see a programming environment that builds on the theory building view as a foundation and optimizes for the quick transfer of the theory between programmers. I've actually been researching and working on such a language for some years now in private, though it's still just in the idea phase. Let me know if this is interesting to you for a future video. This is really the type of content I actually started this channel for, so I'd really appreciate your feedback in the comments below. I also have some more practical videos for using Git on my channel. Check them out here. Have a great day and thanks for watching Philomatics.